uh, protection of property rights, clearly defining property rights, enforcing them, and letting people free uh, to pursue their self-interest within the framework of uh, a clear legal norms respecting individual rights, including property rights, uh, that sets things going. And uh, there is this uh, scarcity of labor. Uh, uh, on the one side, there's a limited capacity to work. On the other side, there's a limitless need and desire for wealth. The key thing is to raise the output per unit of labor. The fundamental economic problem is how do we raise the output per unit of labor? And what do you think the basic answer to that question is in terms of the necessary framework? What framework has to exist economically uh, to uh, create the, the ability to achieve a high and rising productivity of labor? The division of labor. The division of labor, the division of labor and what the division of labor depends on, uh, which I, I uh, began pointing out last week, is the institutions of capitalism. And so uh, that is really the, the, the key, uh, raising the, uh, the productivity of labor, and we need the division of labor and all that's necessary to it. Above all, the private ownership of the means of production and uh, respect for property rights. All right, so here we are. We've, uh, our first major topic has turned out to be the law of diminishing returns. And before leaving it, I hope you'll uh, absorb this statement of the law. Uh, you see, in order to produce anything, as a minimum, we need at least two factors of production. Uh, a factor of production uh, is anything physically required to produce a product. Uh, labor and land are the most elementary factors. Uh, uh, anything previously produced, any sort of tool or material, uh, that uh, uh, represents further factors of production. Uh, um, in making uh, computers, uh, the factors of production would include uh, all the different types of labor required, uh, the various uh, materials. If we're inside a computer factory, uh, there, the starting point would be uh, pre-existing uh, computer chips, uh, perhaps motherboards. Like for Dell, uh, factories of production are motherboards, uh, computer cases, uh, memory chips, hard drives, and uh, the various types of labor uh, that they require. And of course, the uh, assembly facility, the factory building, whatever equipment they'd be using, all of that would represent uh, the factories of production uh, to require uh, required to produce Dell's uh, computer computers. Now, uh, where the uh, law of diminishing returns comes in uh, is in connection with the fact that uh, very very often it is possible uh, to increase the output of a product without increasing all of the necessary factors of production. If you did increase all of the necessary factors, you should expect uh, to be able to increase the output in proportion. If we have uh, two factories of the same kind instead of one, uh, each uh, with the same equipment, we have twice the total equipment uh, in the uh, two factories. If we had twice the uh, requisite types of workers and uh, previously produced components and so forth, uh, we should expect to produce twice uh, the number of computers. But very, very often, it's possible to produce more output without increasing all of the necessary factors. We might hold some of the factors constant. Uh, typically, uh, the factory building, if it's not operating at capacity, uh, you can expand output from the same factory building. Uh, you may only need to add additional labor and materials. Uh, you can expand the output very often from the same uh, facility and equipment. But uh, can you go on expanding the output at a constant rate? Would you be able, just by increasing some of the factors, uh, to uh, keep expanding the output uh, proportionately? You'll reach a plateau. Well, would you stay at a plateau? Like, would it be the case that uh, here we are, let's say we have uh, 100 uh, assembly stations in the Dell facility, 
and presently uh, 60 of them are uh, being utilized, uh, we could bring on uh, the requisite workers and uh, components and so forth uh, to fill the remaining 40, uh, and we might, uh, in this example, get uh, two-thirds more output. But could we bring on 50 workers? we'd have uh, too much labor relative to the same uh, facilities, we'd then need to have more uh, facilities. Now, uh, there are cases, uh, uh, sometimes uh, in order to produce more, you have to expand uh, all of the factors right away. Uh, a clear example of that would be, suppose you wanted to produce uh, cloth dyed to a definite shade. Suppose you wanted to produce uh, cloth dyed to some uh, shade of purple, and it's precise shade. Well, what will happen if you apply more of the dye to the same amount of cloth? It'll be darker, darker than you wanted it. It will be defeating your objective, right? That won't be what you wanted to achieve. Uh, the extra dye, the application of the extra dye would be counterproductive. It would not achieve your productive goal. What would you need in order for that extra dye uh, to be helpful? Wow. You need proportionately more cloth. This is a case of fixed proportions. And there are many, many cases where you have to use the inputs in fixed proportions. But there are other cases in which you can hold some of the inputs fixed and just increase certain of the other inputs. And that illustration I gave a little while ago with a farm of 100 acres and different amounts of man years well, that's uh, a classic illustration. With the same land, uh, we could get more output uh, up to a point. We get diminishing increments beyond a point. Uh, with the same mines, the same thing. And again and again, uh, there are industrial type examples. Uh, suppose uh, we have a flatbed truck. Uh, if we want to have more cargo, uh, do we right away need uh, another truck? No, the same truck uh, can haul a variable amount of cargo. You could have cargo one layer high. Uh, you can have it two layers high, perhaps three. But uh, notice, uh, even at this level, uh, what greater difficulty do you have? It takes longer to get the stuff out of the truck. Well, it takes a little bit longer to put it up and take it down. You have to lift it higher, and then uh, you'll have to secure the cargo uh, more firmly. But there's going to be a point where uh, if you want to haul more cargo, you're going to need another truck. Uh, there's diminishing returns here. You have some variability in how much you can get from the same uh, unit, but uh, it's not, uh, at some point it starts diminishing. And uh, so diminishing returns uh, exist uh, to whatever extent uh, we're producing physical things and you need uh, the different inputs. Uh, if anything is really physically necessary to the output, sooner or later, uh, more of it will either be absolutely essential or, as a minimum, uh, helpful. Uh, uh, to produce more and more crops, in our example, uh, more land would be helpful by the time we got to the second man year. At some point, it would be absolutely essential uh, if you exhausted uh, what could be produced from a given parcel. So. Uh, anytime anything is physically necessary, we're going to need more of it sooner or later, or there'll be an advantage to having more of it. And uh, there's also this closely related element of uh, uh, there being different lands and uh, mines of different degrees of fertility. And uh, since we prefer the most productive first, uh, that means that other things being equal, only less productive ones will remain for later or for uh, further exploitation. So that's the second reason why, uh, as we would expand the output, uh, there would be diminishing returns. And uh, both of these points, uh, I say basis of the law, well, physical quantitative definiteness, that means we can only get so much service from any given physical thing. If we're baking bread, uh, we're going to need more flour pretty fast. Uh, Ultimately, we need more ovens and more bakeries. And then there's this uh, further element, uh, the operation of rational self-interest, which leads us to choose the most productive uses of a factor of production first. We'd want to use the most productive uses of labor first, 
that means applying it to the best grades of land. But uh, if we've used up, if we're fully exploiting the best grades, then only lesser grades remain. All right, let me pause here uh, and ask if we have any, any questions pertaining to diminishing returns. Okay. If any occur to you as we proceed, uh, feel free to raise them. Uh, let me jump back now to the beginning. Uh, our broader subject of discussion is uh, wealth and the economic problem. And I've already indicated the fundamental economic problem. It's how to raise the productivity of labor, how to go on raising the productivity of labor, which is the fundamental scarce element in production in the face of a need and desire for wealth that has no fixed limit. That's the fundamental economic problem. The fundamental solution is a division of labor capitalist economy. That's uh, the basic uh, framework uh, of continually solving the economic problem that's never solved with finality. And we always want to raise the productivity of labor still higher because we can always use still more wealth. Yes. Uh, Okay. Uh, All right. Talked about the diminishing returns. Yeah. Does it apply to diminishing of labor too? No. How far it can go? Diminishing of labor. Okay. Does diminishing returns apply to the division of labor as a, an institution? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, uh, and I would say uh, no, it does not. Uh, diminishing returns applies to uh, physical factors of production. Uh, it applies to. Uh, 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 land sites, uh, factory buildings, machines, tools, uh, to labor at any given time. But let me try to explain uh, how the division of labor is something that, uh, by its nature, works to offset diminishing returns and enable us uh, to escape uh, from its operation. And I think I may have indicated this a little bit uh, two weeks ago. Uh, did I have a discussion of a medical school example? Uh, pardon me? Yeah, okay. All right. The basic point of that was that as we have a larger uh, cooperating population, what happens to the absolute size of the smallest specializations if they're organized into a division of labor? See, if we didn't have a division of labor, suppose we did not have a division of labor society and our population were growing. Okay, now, uh, people have already uh, chosen the best, most productive lands as far as they're aware. Uh, they're exploiting the best, most productive mines as far as they're aware. Now there's more people. Uh, where will the extra people have to go if we don't have a division of labor society? Where do they go when there's a higher population in a third world country? Suppose here you are, uh, you have a father, he owns uh, some little farm, and the father has uh, not one son, but two, three, or four. Now, in some countries, they have an institution, like in Great Britain, they had an institution known as primogeniture, which meant that the eldest son got everything. But then what happened to the other three or two? Tough luck. Uh, one of them might have been, if they were uh, a fairly wealthy family, uh, one of them might have uh, joined the army or navy as an officer. Uh, another might have become a clergyman. Uh, and if they weren't uh, at that status, then uh, they're out in among the masses uh, trying to scratch the barest possible living. In many other places, I believe in China in the past, uh, the land would just be continually subdivided. So now we had the father with one decent sized plot. Now there are two or three sons uh, having to form a half or a third. Well, what do you think happens uh, to their output per capita? It's obviously down. And uh, what do you think that does uh, to the number of people who can survive? What does it do uh, to their state of health and, and general well being and nutrition? It reduces it, and so can you see any kind of natural check uh, to 
population in such circumstances. Well, the, the people are more poorly nourished, right? What happens if they have a bad year and the crops come in below normal? They have a famine. And if people are weakened uh, from lack of proper nutrition, what happens to their susceptibility to disease? That goes up, and, and you have the stage set uh, for plagues, which were part of the uh, regular history of mankind. Famine, recurring famines and plagues uh, were uh, part of the history of mankind until very, very recently, and in some parts of the world still are, or would be in the absence of uh, Western aid, uh, down to uh, perhaps the uh, 18th century. Uh, this was a recurring pattern. And that's what served always to limit population. You'd have diminishing returns to people in non-division of labor societies. They'd run up against the uh, limitation of the available land and uh, natural resources. And uh, they'd hit a stone wall that would uh, periodically wipe out large numbers of human beings. Now, the only when uh, the division of labor began to take hold uh, could this change? And a division of labor represents our foremost security against this sort of thing. Because in a division of labor society, when we have more people, does this mean that we have to have people uh, having to start farms higher up the hillsides, into the mountains, down into the swamps, uh, subdivide the parcels of land? Uh, when we have more people, we have more people going into uh, the different branches of the division of labor. And a major uh, subset of these branches uh, are the branches concerned with the acquisition and application of new knowledge. All of the uh, branches of science, engineering, and also business. Business is very closely connected with science and engineering. Uh, business firms are uh, seeking to set scientists and engineers to work, solving definite problems. They're interested in what the scientists and engineers are accomplishing on their own, if they have any possible uh, commercial exploitation value. And so uh, business is fostering uh, scientific and technological development. And as that occurs, what is the effect on the productivity of labor? It raises it. Now, uh, we still have diminishing returns, but because of scientific and technological progress made possible by the framework of a division of labor. So you just think, uh, in that doctor example, the medical school example, I gave you an example. We had a population of four million people, which by various assumptions, could support one reasonably efficient-sized medical school that would ultimately have 4,000 practicing physicians, but only four of them might be brain specialists or some other specialization. Uh, what happens if we have a society instead of 4 million, 400 million with the same ratios? What does that do to the absolute number of these specialists, in this case, the brain specialists? We have 400 instead of four. Now, the same point would apply uh, to all of the different branches of engineering and science. Now, if you have a larger absolute number of intelligent, motivated people, what and they're working in these uh, areas of specialization. They're working on various branches of science, mathematics, uh, engineering, and business innovation. What is the likelihood of successful innovations? It's much higher. And what will be the effect of that on the productivity of labor? It'll go up. There'll be new methods of production, new types of machines, uh, new abilities of all kinds to do things. And that operates to offset uh, the law of diminishing returns. And uh, the way I illustrate it, here we are. This is our initial situation. Uh, that's, uh, let's say that's where we stood in uh, 1804 or 1904. Now, uh, I, okay, that the above was 1904. Now, because of uh, tremendous scientific and technological innovation, uh, uh, especially as manifested in improved tools and machines, uh, brand new processes, uh, the output at all the different stages is multiplied, uh, I'm assuming by a factor of 10. 
Now we still have diminishing returns, but the returns diminish from a much higher point. We still have uh, differences in uh, degrees of quality of land and mines, but uh, uh, all of the absolute amounts are higher. Uh, they're diminishing from higher levels. Now I think uh, you can see this, uh, if you think about it, I think it's fairly obvious. Today, as a hundred years ago, uh, we have diminishing returns in agriculture and mining. But the point where we leave off today is uh, probably far, far higher than the point where people started a hundred years ago. The poorest lands and mines uh, in production today in a modern country are, you can be sure, far more productive than the very best such lands were a hundred years ago. So you just think of any uh, mining operation uh, in a first world country or probably in a country where uh, the companies of such a country are investing, uh, how much iron uh, would be extracted uh, by a hundred workers uh, in a day a hundred years ago? What would they be using to get the iron ore out? Probably shovels and, and, and axes. Uh, what would uh, workers be using today? A huge uh, steam shovels uh, lifting 100, 200 ton loads. Uh, so yes, they're still diminishing returns. Uh, if we attempt to bring in uh, two or three such pieces of equipment into the same mining sector, uh, there's going to be diminishing returns. Uh, just as there would be diminishing returns if we have too many men uh, with shovels in the same limited area. But uh, from where do the returns diminish today compared with then? From a radically higher level. And uh, it's very possible uh, to continue this process. Uh, what if we uh, reach a day, uh, which I don't think is uh, by any means uh, far-fetched, uh, instead of having uh, a worker uh, operating one of these uh, uh, bulldo one of these uh, steam shovels, uh, you might have a worker uh, in some uh, control hub uh, operating several such uh, units uh, through computers and fiber optics or whatever, uh, and, and various programs and uh, achieving still greater results. And certainly in agriculture, uh, what's happened uh, to the extent to which we need farmers? We need fewer of them. Uh, far, far fewer of them. Uh, what percentage of our population lived in agriculture uh, when the United States was founded, roughly in 1790? Anyone know? Yeah, on the order of 90%. Uh, what's the percentage today? Less than five. Less than five, I think closer to three. And even that is more than we need because there are these uh, farm surpluses. Now, uh, what has happened uh, to the output of agricultural products uh, produced just by 3% of the population? Uh, what's the supply of agricultural products per capita uh, coming from the 3% compared to what used to come from the 90 percent. It's vastly greater, uh, much more varied, and the supply uh, of minerals the same way. So you just think, uh, what was one of the leading iron products of the 18th or 17th century? Uh, who, were, who were producing the iron products in those days? English. Uh, Pardon me? Well, blacksmiths. Blacksmiths. And a leading product would be uh, horseshoes, uh, some nails. Uh, the first, one of the early accomplishments of the Industrial Revolution in England was the very first iron bridge across some uh, relatively small river, uh, I think somewhere in northern England. Prior to that, there was no such thing as an iron bridge. Uh, Today, uh, what kind of iron do we have per capita? And various other materials that uh, didn't even exist in earlier days. Uh, think of the iron that, that you take for granted that uh, is in your automobile, uh, your, your appliances, or other metals. How much do we have per capita? 
and then uh, petrochemicals and so forth, which are of very recent origin. So we have uh, much more of these things uh, per capita. Okay, well, let me uh, go further. Uh, we'll go back uh, to the beginning. Uh, I give, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, under the heading Wealth and the Economic Problem, at uh, some point soon I want to discuss what I call the wealth-centeredness of economics. And I start off with a definition of wealth. I say it's material goods made by man. And we need to distinguish it from uh, other things uh, that are often confused with it, uh, like stocks, bonds, bank deposits. Uh, these are claims to wealth, uh, but they are not wealth it them itself. Uh, wealth, as I say, is material goods made by man. It's automobiles, houses, steel mills, uh, bars of, uh, of copper. Uh, it's uh, wheat fields, tractors. Uh, it is not stocks and bonds or bank deposits. Stocks and bonds are claims to uh, physical assets, uh, such as factory buildings and their equipment, as are uh, bank deposits. Or they might be claims to houses and uh, the land sites on which the houses stand. Uh, licenses uh, have a market value, but they're not wealth. Uh, what does a license give you? Yeah, per permission uh, to engage in some activity. Now, uh, is that permission uh, a material good? I mean, what would happen if you didn't require the permission? What would happen uh, to the production of the actual goods uh, for which the permission is made a requirement? It would increase. So uh, a license, so far from being wealth, is actually, uh, actually represents a restriction on the production of wealth, a diminution. But the license uh, can have a substantial market value. Uh, in places like New York City, where you need a license uh, to operate a taxi cab cruising the streets for hire, uh, the license is worth a, su a, su a substantial multiple of the value of the cab. But the license is not wealth. The taxi cab is wealth. The license is not. The license uh, achieves an economic value uh, by virtue of uh, holding back the number of cabs and uh, inflating the uh, rates that can be received uh, for operating a cab. If you had uh, free competition, uh, the, you'd have uh, more cabs, lower fares, lower incomes uh, for cab drivers. Uh, there'd be no basis for the value of a license. The license derives its value from the extra uh, surplus income that the artificial scarcity makes it possible to earn. Now, I've said wealth is material goods made by man, uh, and then I try to explain goods, uh, economic goods specifically. Uh, these, are, uh, go th these are things, uh, an economic good is a material thing that uh, meets a number of criteria simultaneously. Uh, before a thing can achieve the status of a good or wealth, uh, it first has to be recognized, it has to be recognized as having the power to serve a human need or want. That's one essential requirement. If something is not recognized as possessing such power, uh, it's not an economic good, it's not wealth. Now, why isn't it an economic good? Well, uh, does it, if, if its benefit does not come to us automatically, so there are some things whose benefit comes to us automatically. We don't have to take, make any effort or produce anything or take any steps. Uh, atmospheric air and sunlight, uh, these are things whose benefit comes to us without any uh, effort uh, or action on our part. Uh, we don't have to produce uh, sunlight. We don't have to produce the air we normally breathe. Uh, these things are called free goods, free goods. But economic goods are things that uh, do not come to us automatically. 
that uh, in order uh, to obtain their benefit, uh, we have to expend some kind of labor or effort. An essential requirement of a thing being an economic good uh, is that it requires the performance of labor or effort uh, to be enjoyed. Now, would we expend any labor or effort uh, on obtaining something whose benefit doesn't come to us automatically if we didn't recognize that it, that it would do us, that, would, that it would be a benefit to us? Would we go out and attempt to uh, achieve anything whose uh, benefit we didn't perceive if, it, if the benefit didn't come to us automatically? No. no. Okay, now, uh, so uh, things like the metals, uh, in distinction to, the sun, to sunlight and atmospheric air, uh, the benefit of uh, iron ore and copper ore and things of that kind, that does not come to us automatically. Uh, before people uh, would take steps uh, to uh, acquire such things, they'd have to be aware of the benefits to be derived. And only when those benefits uh, began to be discovered uh, did things like iron and copper uh, become economic goods and wealth. Uh, to all of our Stone Age ancestors, none of the metals represented economic goods or wealth. None of these things were economic goods or wealth to the people of the Stone Ages. Much more recently, uh, does anyone know when, radi the, uh, when radium was discovered and its uh, useful properties discovered? Roughly, not the precise year, but... You know, actually, I think sometime in the, in the 1800s, a little before. Pardon me? Marie Curie? Yeah, Madame Curie. Yes, she is the discoverer of radium and its properties. Uh, uranium and its properties uh, were not discovered until sometime in the 20th century. Uh, now, was uh, radium an economic good uh, before its useful properties were discovered? No, no nor was uh, uranium. Uh, when were the useful properties of petroleum first discovered? By me? The, uh, 1700s, 1800s? Uh, for sometime uh, in after the middle of the 19th century, in around 18, I think the first oil well was uh, around 1859. Yeah. So uh, prior to that time, people were aware of the existence of petroleum, but uh, they thought uh, all the, the, its only effect was to poison the drinking water of cattle. Uh, they saw no uh, useful properties of petroleum. It was only when it became recognized that you could use petroleum uh, to make kerosene. Now, maybe before that, uh, they were using it as axle grease. I don't know. I thought the first use uh, was kerosene. That was the first significant use. Uh, when it was realized that here's this uh, gunk that you can use to make kerosene, and kerosene uh, can be used to, uh, as fuel for lanterns, uh, then uh, petroleum uh, began uh, to become an economic good, only for the first time. Uh, th there are other things that have become economic goods uh, even much more recently. Uh, uh, parts of the, uh, of, of the radio spectrum, or, or the whole of the, the, the radio wave spectrum. Uh, before radio was discovered, uh, was... Uh, uh, could we derive good uh, from uh, the radio wave spectrum? No. And there have been aspects of this uh, spectrum that have been discovered only very recently, and uh, one of the most recent fruits is uh, cell phones. Uh, they operate over a part of the spectrum, uh, and Wi-Fi uh, computers, uh, these are operating over parts of the spectrum that uh, until recently uh, were thought to be uh, useless. So. Uh, new uses can be discovered uh, for things, or uh, uses from scratch. Now, uh, in order uh, for a thing to be an economic good or wealth, as I say, it has to meet a number of requirements simultaneously. Uh, first off, uh, the most fundamental requirement, which I've mixed in with, with another, is that the thing actually possess properties. It actually has to possess properties of a kind that make it possible for it to serve a human need or want. It has to possess such properties. Then those properties need to be recognized. And its benefit uh, has to require 
the performance of labor or effort to be enjoyed. These are requirements. And then, on top of all that, we have to possess uh, sufficient command over the thing. We have to have it in our power such that we can actually direct it to the satisfaction of a need or want. And finally, we have to be able to do that in a way that is gainful. Now, if a thing uh, does not meet all of these requirements at the same time, it is not yet an economic good and not yet wealth. Atmospheric air and sunlight, they're out because uh, they don't require labor or effort to be enjoyed. Uh, what about oil or uranium before their uses were discovered? No, they were not economic goods or wealth until their uses were discovered. Now what about something like iron on Mars? It's virtually certain there's a lot of iron on Mars. That's why it has uh, its red appearance that I, I believe is from rust, a lot of rust, iron oxide. And we know the useful properties of iron, but why isn't any of the iron up on Mars as yet an economic good or wealth? Yeah, we have no access to it. It's totally beyond our reach. We're not in a position in which we can make the iron on Mars as yet do us any actual good. Now, even if uh, we get the ability to get uh, some of the iron back, and probably uh, one of the uh, missions in the not-too-distant future uh, will go out and come back with the soil samples, well, uh, you still could not reasonably view uh, iron on Mars as an economic good if it costs $100 billion to send a spaceship up there and then it returns uh, with a few ounces of iron ore. Uh, why wouldn't uh, such iron ore uh, be in the category of an economic good uh, given the criteria I've listed? We don't uh, possess sufficient command to make it, uh, make it turn into wealth. And we couldn't carry this on gainfully. We couldn't carry this on gainfully. If we're using up $100 billion worth of wealth uh, to gain $5 worth of wealth, are we uh, uh, creating wealth on net balance or consuming it? We'd be consuming it. Uh, this would not be a way of achieving our economic good. It might be justified on grounds of scientific research, but it would not be a wealth-creating activity. Uh, the same point would apply to desert land. If you've driven uh, between Los Angeles or Orange County and Las Vegas, uh, once you get uh, in the region of Barstow and beyond, uh, there's an awful lot of uh, empty desert land. Now, we have the technological knowledge uh, to make uh, any part of that land into highly productive farms. And what would you need to do that? We'd have to irrigate it. We might have to add uh, various trace chemicals. But uh, we certainly could do it if we wanted to. Would that be a wealth-creating activity, uh, given the fact that we presently have available vastly better land? Uh, do, do we need to irrigate the farmland in Illinois and Iowa and places like that? Uh, do we need to undergo other uh, costly preparation? No. So uh, if we were to... Uh, uh, utilize the potential of uh, the land around Barstow, it would mean either that we'd be withdrawing labor and capital from more productive lands elsewhere in the country, or we'd be uh, withdrawing labor and capital from other lines of production uh, where they're producing products that we want more than additional farm products. Uh, we would uh, be stepping up the production of farm products around Barstow in a way that caused us economic loss. We'd be producing less than we produce uh, by leaving that land barren. Now maybe in some future time, if we had a vastly larger population and we needed more agricultural land, then maybe we'd have to call that land into cultivation. And at that point, uh, it might be used gainfully uh, in, with a much larger population. But only then would it become an economic good and wealth. Uh, let me say a quick word about the uh, service industries. Uh, for quite a few years, uh, a majority of the labor force has been employed in various service industries rather than in the direct production of physical goods. The direct wealth-producing industries are manufacturing, uh, agriculture, 
mining and construction. These are clearly producing uh, physical goods. But uh, the majority of the labor force uh, no longer works in these uh, four direct goods producing industries. Uh, the majority works in various service industries, uh, such as retailing, wholesaling, finance, insurance, advertising, uh, communications, uh, transportation, uh, repairs. And uh, on this basis, uh, it's uh, frequently or more often than not uh, concluded that economics is no longer a science uh, primarily concerned with the production of wealth because uh, more people are employed in producing services and that therefore it is now equally if not more uh, a subject that deals with the production of services. But I'd like to explain why I think that uh, uh, wealth is still the primary factor, goods are still the primary factor uh, rather than uh, services. Uh, by considering uh, the nature of these services, I think it becomes clear that uh, the great bulk of the services that are performed in the economic system uh, are performed as an auxiliary to the production or distribution of wealth. So you just think, uh, re here's retailing and, and wholesaling, major, major service industries. But what are the retailers and wholesalers retailing and wholesaling? goods. <coughs> the retailers are retailing goods. <coughs> the wholesalers are wholesaling goods. <coughs> so these are service industries, but they're service industries that are auxiliary uh, to the production of goods. They serve to bring the goods produced uh, to the various people who will use them. <coughs> now, what about uh, all of the services performed uh, in connection with repairs? Repairs are repairs of what? Goods. Uh, so that's another auxiliary to the production of goods. Uh, what about uh, insurance and finance? What is at least a major, major part of insurance? Insurance of, I would think, the great bulk of insurance, probably. The goods. Property insurance of one form or another. Uh, what is uh, most of the transportation system uh, used to transport? goods, uh, at least, uh, I don't know the precise percentage, but that's certainly huge. Uh, what about uh, 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 probably the bulk of communications, all of the communications going on uh, between business firms? That's communications with respect to goods or to services auxiliary to the production of goods. Uh, what about advertising? What is most advertising the advertising of? goods or services auxiliary uh, to their production. Uh, what is most uh, uh, finance activity uh, concerned with? The production of goods or the purchase of goods. Now, uh, there are uh, significant services uh, which are not merely auxiliary uh, to the production of goods. And these would be personal services, like personal medical services, personal legal services, uh, uh, personal uh, airline and train uh, transportation services, uh, taxi cab services, uh, grooming services, uh, legal services. Uh, these are uh, significant uh, branches of services uh, that cannot be subsumed uh, as uh, auxiliary uh, to the production of goods. And uh, they are uh, a necessary uh, aspect of economics. Economics certainly does uh, deal uh, with, these, uh, with these services too. But I would say that the perspective that brings them uh, under the heading of uh, treatment by economics is that uh, the production and sale of these services is the uh, means whereby the providers of them are enabled to acquire wealth that they are unable to purchase wealth. Uh, the fact that uh, barbers and beauticians uh, can use the money they earn in barbering and uh, in uh, operating beauty parlors, uh, uh, that money is what enables them uh, to buy uh, the various material goods they require. Now, 
uh, if we had, uh, if we consider services that do not have a substantial connection to goods, I would say economics does not study such services. Uh, can anyone think of services without a substantial connection to goods? Well, couldn't you describe a conversation between two people as a mutual rendition of service? But does economics study conversation? No. Uh, it studies services uh, insofar as the services are needed in the production of goods. It studies labor. Uh, that's required for the production of anything. It studies all of the services that are auxiliary uh, to the production of goods, and it studies those further uh, personal services that are the means whereby the providers are enabled to purchase goods. But when we get to services that have no such connection to goods, uh, I think they fall outside the purview of economics, like conversation. Yes? Um, so as far as jobs leaving the United States, uh -huh. And if I understand you right, when the jobs are leaving the United States and jobs are created here, service oriented jobs, wealth would still continue to be produced because they are good related. For instance, uh, uh, jobs that are exported to China. Yeah. That are clothing. Clothing yeah. yeah. Like Levi. Uh huh. If that job leaves, the job the wealth would still be created in the United States because it is a good oriented job. Is that correct? Well, uh, I wouldn't say uh, that the that the goods those goods would still be created in the United States because in your example they're uh, produced outside. But I would say that uh, these activities, any money-making activities that are going on in the United States, uh, whatever we're doing that enables us to buy goods, either that we produce here or that are produced anywhere in the world, uh, that still comes under the heading of economics. Now, but there's a separate uh, issue that you raise uh, in connection uh, with the loss of certain categories of, of industry uh, from the United States to outside the country. Uh, which could be considered uh, separately of any from anything I've said so far tonight. Uh, uh, there are industries that we've either lost or have lost significant chunks of uh, that would not have been necessary for us to lose. Uh, I don't know if I raised this uh, last week or, or two weeks ago or not. Uh, uh, in the United States today, we uh, import a substantial proportion of our automobiles. And I don't think we export all that many of them any longer. Uh, could anyone think of any, uh, anything that might be changed that would uh, enable the American automobile industry and also the American steel industry uh, to be much more competitive uh, at home and abroad? Uh, things that uh, hold these industries back uh, that are impositions on them uh, that they would not have to contend with if they had economic freedom. Well, you say emission controls, uh, possibly, but what about uh, more directly at the production end? The labor unions. See, uh, isn't it a widely complained of phenomenon, uh, the so-called Monday morning cars? Uh, many cars produced in the United States, it's alleged, are inferior if they happen to have been produced on a Monday morning. Why? Because it's alleged that uh, a substantial number of workers come in Monday morning uh, not prepared to work, or they don't show up Monday morning, uh, they've had too uh, zestful a weekend. Now. Uh, the automobile companies are not stupid. Uh, they know that this is a problem and it's costing them uh, market share and, and profits. Why don't they say uh, to their workers, especially in view of the fact that there are workers who either are unemployed or working in lower paid jobs elsewhere in the economy who could do the work of automobile workers, why don't they say, uh, we expect that anyone we employ will show up uh, promptly uh, at starting time Monday morning uh, in a condition able to work. 
And if you don't, then don't show up at all. Uh, your job will be given to someone else. Why don't they do that? That doesn't seem all that complicated. And if, if they did, uh, this problem would be overcome. Uh, the unions, they would have a, a bigger uh, problem with the unions uh, as they see it than uh, the, the benefits uh, from, from trying to do this. Uh, they have a, a long protracted strike that they end up they might end up not even winning so they don't do it but uh, why do they have to deal with the unions why are the unions uh, able to be such a threat why can't a company simply say uh, we no longer recognize this union if this is what the union wants from us if they want to deprive us of the ability to compete successfully to hell with this union we're not going to deal with them they can shut down the labor for a period but what allows them to do that? Because if there are other people able to do the job, why can't the company say, oh, we're just going to replace you? Laws. There are laws. There are laws. Uh, you'd be held guilty of some kind of unfair labor practice. Uh, you might uh, end up being made to pay triple back pay and damages. Or you flat out wouldn't be allowed to do it. Uh, since 1935, uh, we've had legislation that compels employers, whether they want to or not, to deal with these labor unions. And since uh, 1932, I believe, uh, employers have been deprived of any kind of uh, legal protection against uh, intimidating mass picketing. You've probably all seen uh, newsreels of uh, a factory on strike. Uh, some people are trying to get to work, and there's a bunch of gorillas uh, working out, lifting the car up and down uh, as uh, uh, people are attempting to gain entrance. Well, uh, why should they be allowed to get away with such threats? Well, since 1932, the federal government has, and uh, 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 from about that time, or a little bit later, uh, practically all state and local governments too, have had a policy of turning their back on union violence and intimidation. They don't prosecute, except in, in the most egregious cases. If uh, a union uh, official or if some union uh, goon uh, murders somebody, uh, maybe he'll be prosecuted. But uh, practically anything short of that, uh, uh, the, the police turn away. Uh, the district attorneys don't prosecute. So this is why uh, companies are compelled uh, to deal with unions, and it's why uh, the United States economy has unnecessarily suffered uh, internationally. And then uh, there are further factors uh, to the extent we have uh, other forms of government regulation that impose uh, higher costs on American firms. Uh, that puts them at a disadvantage, too. Just a comment. Uh, Pardon me? The U.S. may not be exporting automobiles, but they are exporting military equipment. They're, they're exporting what? They're exporting defense equipment. For example, F-16s, F-20s, you know. Uh, they're exporting uh, defense uh, yeah, goods. Okay, the United States uh, armament industry apparently has some exports. Uh, we still export uh, airplanes. Uh, we export a large volume of television programs and probably uh, motion pictures, too. So there are certainly things uh, we still export. But we could have uh, uh, major exports uh, in manufacturing in such areas as uh, automobiles and steel uh, if uh, uh, our firms were not legally compelled to deal with unions that render them uh, much less efficient than they need to be. Yes, uh, Mr. Yes. Just a question. So, do other countries then not have uh, a form of a union? Do other countries uh, not have uh, their unions? Uh, there certainly are other countries that have uh, worse, more powerful unions than we do, uh, like France and, uh, and probably Germany. And then uh, there are countries uh, like Japan and Taiwan. They have, they have unions in Japan, but uh, the unions are practically all, as I understand, company unions. They're like aspects of the, uh, or uh, uh, branches of the personnel department. Uh, so uh, it's a very different situation. Yes? I thought unions are, are there to protect the workers and to help them have a decent wages. Okay, uh, uh, her understanding is that unions are there 
uh, to protect the workers and achieve decent wages and conditions and so forth. Yeah, that is uh, what most people are educated to believe. Uh, that's what uh, uh, that's what you would uh, be brought up uh, going to school, uh, watching PBS, reading the uh, New York or LA Times and uh, Time Magazine. But uh, I, I'm sorry to uh, unsettle you. Uh, uh, economic theory has a, a different uh, perception on the effect of labor unions, and I assure you this is not just me. Uh, if you're aware of the principle uh, that other things being equal, the higher the price, the lower the quantity that people will purchase, the lower the quantity demanded. Well, what is the effect of all efforts uh, arbitrarily to jack up any price or wage on the amount of it that will be purchased? Yeah. Pardon me? Then what's the effect of all efforts to arbitrarily jack up any wage or price above the free market level? What is the effect on the quantity that people will purchase at an artificially higher price? It goes down. It goes down. And it's precisely in achieving above market wage rates that the unions cause unemployment. Now, you can have a union in a given uh, occupation. Let's say uh, we look just at a carpenter's union. Uh, you can have a carpenter's union uh, that achieves higher wage rates for carpenters. But in the process, it causes the employment of fewer carpenters. Now, uh, wh where do the people go who otherwise would have been carpenters uh, but uh, who can't find employment as carpenters? Suppose you wanted to be a carpenter, but uh, there's no demand for your services as a carpenter at the uh, union mandated level of carpenters' wage rates. You'll have to work in some other capacity, right? Who knows what you'll do? Different people will seek to do different things. Well, what is the effect on the supply of labor in other lines that the displaced carpenters go into? It's greater. Now, those additional workers can be absorbed in these other lines, but what's the effect, what would have to happen to absorb them in other lines, uh, given that there's now more such people? Instead of having as many carpenters as we would have, we have fewer carpenters and an overflow into other lines, because the wage of the, wage of the carpenters is artificially high. Well, in order for them to expand, in order for, for more people to be employed in other lines, uh, what has to happen to the wage or price to step up the quantity demanded? The wage would have to go down. So uh, what has been achieved by the carpenters' union? Well, they've gotten a higher wage for carpenters and higher costs of carpentry work and prices for uh, those goods. And they've caused lower wages in other lines. They've created an artificial inequality of wage rates. And exactly the same thing would apply uh, to fields restricted by licensing. So now, if you have uh, the unions controlling every field, if they could control every field, and they're setting wage rates artificially high across the board, then what happens? Then you have unemployment. Then you have unemployment. You have unemployment. And between uh, widespread unions, or unions, you see, the unions have the power uh, to influence wage rates far beyond the bounds of the unionized industries. One shouldn't think that the only places that unions can set wage rates are in the unionized fields. Uh, any uh, firm that wants to be sure to avoid being unionized, uh, what do they have to do? Uh, to keep their workers happy. They have to pay them wages uh, close to uh, what they could get belonging to a union. Uh, it's the lesser evil from the company's point of view. Uh, they pay the higher wage, but then they don't have to contend with the union's interference in work rules and further inefficiencies that could be imposed. So uh, the unions Im uh, impose their wage scales uh, far beyond the limits of the fields they directly control. 
and uh, to the extent they do this, uh, they're displacing workers from all these lines, causing them to crowd into other areas, and uh, to the extent these workers are more able, more intelligent, more capable, uh, they displace other workers who have to uh, move down, and uh, the whole uh, negative force accumulates at the bottom, and then if you have a minimum wage law, uh, you have unemployment. So there's this, again, this stems from the basic premise that any uh, ar uh, artificial laws imposed upon uh, those trying to create wealth is going to uh, decrease the health of the economy. Yes, so it'll labor laws, uh, government well, government corruption, which prevents uh, free growth of the economy. Yeah. And uh, what about things like equal opportunity laws? How does that? Uh, equal opportunity laws. Okay, let me step back for a second and name the underlying principle. Uh, the reason why these, this interference has negative effects is either it's uh, forcibly preventing people from acting for their peaceful self-interest, stopping them from doing what would be beneficial to them and to the self-interest of those with whom they dealt, or compelling them to act against their self-interest. Now, uh, equal opportunity laws uh, I, I would say there's a, a lot of uh, fallaciousness here. Uh, the, the whole notion of an equal opportunity. Uh, they need, uh, new com companies need new chief executives. I don't know when General Motors last needed a new president. Uh, sometimes in the years ahead, they'll need another new president. Uh, did I have an equal opportunity to be considered for that job? Did you have an equal opportunity? <clears throat> Should we have an equal opportunity? Who would have an opportunity to be considered uh, for the job of president of General Motors? Well, other CEOs, uh, senior vice presidents of General Motors, a very limited number of people. People who have, uh, ach have major achievements uh, which put them in the zone of possible consideration. Uh, the immense majority of people have no such opportunity. Now, this whole idea of equality of opportunity, see, this is a view of the world. It thinks that uh, they're like waiters going around with trays of opportunities. <laughs> and uh, they're serving some people opportunities and not serving them to others. But if you think about the, the meaning of an opportunity, all that an opportunity means is an occasion on which successful action is possible. An occasion on which successful action is possible. And there are always such occasions. And uh, any time, if there's any skill you don't possess, but have it within your power to acquire, that's an opportunity. If there's any job that you are capable of doing that uh, an employer uh, would like to use you for, uh, that's an opportunity. Uh, if it's true that we have uh, virtually limitless needs and desires and labor is the uh, scarce element in production, then uh, basically there should be more opportunities uh, for performing labor than the labor we're able to perform. Our uh, basic question should be, which of the, uh, of the opportunities are the best to exploit? <clears throat> Now, the problem with opportunities is not lack of equality of opportunity, but lack of freedom of opportunity. What we want is the freedom to exploit the opportunities that are out there in the nature of reality. And as we exploit opportunities, uh, we then become qualified to exploit bigger, better opportunities. So you just think, uh, at one time, you had an opportunity to learn uh, arithmetic. Uh, some people, some students, didn't bother to exploit that opportunity very well. Uh, can they ever have the opportunity to learn algebra? If, if only after they mastered arithmetic. But unless you master arithmetic, you have no opportunity to learn algebra. And unless you master algebra, you have no opportunity to learn calculus. Well, it's very, very similar uh, in the business world. Uh, let's say you start out, your only opportunity is working as an assistant sweeper in some mill. Uh, that's uh, your only uh, job opportunity at the moment. But let's say you take it. Uh, uh, you learn uh, that job, what it requires, 
uh, you establish a reputation as a reliable uh, regular employee now maybe you'll have an opportunity uh, to be promoted to something a little bit higher and then if you perform well uh, in that job you have opportunities to go still further you have to think of uh, the exploitation of opportunities as uh, in effect climbing the rungs of a ladder okay the more successfully you've exploited opportunities earlier in your life the greater will be the range of opportunities uh, later in your life and uh, this is why uh, there's always inequality of opportunity the opportunities open to anyone at a given time depend on uh, what he's done with his life up to that point as well as the external circumstances and the idea of an equality of opportunity it ignores uh, what individuals have done with their life up to that time. It assumes that uh, the outcome, what happens to people, is the uh, automated product of external circumstances and their genes. And it ignores uh, all of the necessary self-development that has to go on. Now, actually, I have uh, a lengthy discussion of this in uh, Part B of Chapter 9, which we'll get to uh, sometime after the midterm. But... Uh, I think this is uh, an utterly invalid concept, uh, equality of opportunity. What you really want is the freedom of opportunity. Let people be free to exploit the best of the opportunities then available to them. And if they can do that, then they will almost certainly be in a position to exploit better opportunities later on because they will have gained something by the exploitation of the earlier opportunities. They'll confront newer opportunities with a better, more powerful uh, apparatus of skills. Yes, uh, Mr. Labor Union. Yeah. Would you agree that a large contributor to the failure of the major airlines over the past and the ones today that are having issues with labor concessions and wages? Oh, would I agree that uh, the problem of many of the major airlines is the uh, union deals they have? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, I think there are some airlines that are, are non-union, am I correct, uh, that are doing just fine. Uh, but it's the unionized airlines. Now, uh, unions is a subject that we'll go into in greater detail uh, toward the very end of the term, uh, going into the economic history of things, uh, why the standard of living was in fact so low in the era before the unions uh, how come uh, it rose over the same course of time as the unions we'll see there's no connection between the unions and the improvement uh, they actually were working the other way uh, we'll explore that uh, fully that'll be the last two weeks of the term and I go into that material for anyone who can't stand the suspense uh, in uh, uh, chapters 11 and 14 so okay now, uh, we've touched on uh, scarcity uh, to some extent. Uh, uh, I'm claiming that uh, no matter how abundant it may be, uh, wealth is always scarce in the sense that the need and desire uh, for, for still more wealth is, is there. The need and desire are always still greater, uh, no matter how much wealth we have. Uh, think of Bill Gates. Uh, another illustration, I think, a wider one, if uh, someone does not own an automobile and he's aware of automobiles well almost certainly he'd like to own one if he owns one he'd almost certainly like to own a newer better one if he owns several of the newest best automobiles then uh, the odds are very heavy he'd like a yacht or a plane if he has a yacht and a plane then uh, he's very possibly going to be looking out for a yacht on which the plane can land there is always uh, something uh, further and I'll try to show uh, why this is not uh, accidental. Now, uh, I've said that uh, economics uh, is the science that studies the production of wealth under a system of division of labor. And uh, I think implicitly uh, economics is obliged to establish the importance of wealth. If wealth were an unimportant matter, if it were a trivial uh, secondary issue, uh, then the science that studies it in any fundamental way could not be any more important. If wealth were uh, a second-class uh, object of study, economics would be a second-class subject. Uh, I don't think economics is a second-class subject. I think it's a first-class subject. 
and uh, to establish that, it's necessary to us to provide an objective uh, basis uh, for uh, the importance of wealth, uh, a, a f an objective foundation showing why we have a limitless need and desire for wealth. Now, our need for wealth is not limited uh, to our need for food, clothing, and shelter. Those are very important aspects of it. But our need for wealth extends to virtually every activity we, we uh, carry out, uh, such things uh, as art, uh, science, music, athletics, human relationships. Virtually every human activity without exception depends upon or is substantially facilitated uh, by the use of wealth adapted to it. And we'll take as our uh, first and last example before the break. Uh, think of the specific forms of wealth that contribute uh, to the activity music. What are uh, specific forms of wealth that contribute to music? Art. Pardon me? Instruments. All of the musical instruments, uh, violins, pianos, all venues. of the... Pardon me? Venues. Uh, ven to yeah, uh, concert halls, uh, uh, s uh, symphony halls, uh, how about, uh, pardon me? Radio. Radios, uh, phonographs, CD players, uh, music videos, uh, schools of music, books of music, the musical scores. Uh, all of these things are forms of wealth that contribute uh, to the activity music. Now, if we remove them all, what would be left of music? Suppose uh, we did not employ any uh, forms of wealth specifically adapted to music. You could still have some activity, but what would be the level of it? It would be the untrained singing, the untrained singing and tapping, because uh, to have trained singing, you need music schools, music teachers, uh, instruments, uh, timers, whatever, uh, and also to a very small audience. If you want to have uh, Pavarotti uh, singing at the Colosseum in Rome or something and watched by a worldwide audience, uh, well, then you need uh, all of these uh, forms of wealth, uh, including things like uh, television and DVDs and all the rest. Uh, these are contributing. So there are activities that can exist at a certain level without uh, the employment of wealth, but virtually every activity is very substantially improved by the employment of wealth and can be more improved uh, by the employment of still more wealth. And we'll look at further examples uh, when we return in 25 minutes. So I hope you're finding uh, this material uh, from a different perspective. Uh, some of you may be very unhappy with it. Uh, that's my experience. And I'm sure I'll read all about it uh, at the end of the term when you write your evaluations. <laughs> uh, there are many, many people who think that these ideas should just never uh, be presented uh, in a, a university classroom. Uh, they like dirty the carpet or something. And uh, certainly not have a whole term out of your 20 years of education uh, devoted to such heretical ideas. OK, see you in 25 minutes. Okay, I think we should resume. Presumably a few more people will come back in. Uh, we left off. Uh, I was attempting to, to develop the point, uh, to, to develop the scope of the need for wealth, uh, uh, to show that it's necessary to virtually every human activity it facilitates it in some way. And I just gave the illustration of uh, the wealth adapted to music. Now, uh, the wealth adapted to uh, art uh, includes all of the uh, books of art, uh, reprints of uh, paintings, museums, uh, schools uh, where art is taught. Uh, it hopefully will include, in years to come, uh, these uh, wall-mounted uh, LCD monitors or plasma monitors. Uh, one of the things Microsoft is uh, engaged in is buying up the, the rights to uh, famous paintings around the world. Uh, that'll be something that'll be shown someday uh, on uh, these devices. Uh, science, uh, all of the laboratory apparatus, uh, the university buildings, the textbooks of science, uh, this represents uh, wealth adapted to uh, science. 
uh, take it away and science would be reduced uh, to uh, a, a meager oral tradition, uh, uh, people scratching a circle in the sand with their toe perhaps, uh, we could not have anything remotely approaching uh, the science that we have uh, without very considerable wealth employed uh, in its uh, 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 accumulation and uh, dissemination. And I uh, should have mentioned uh, computers. Uh, that's certainly very important, too, in, in science. Uh, athletics, uh, the athletic equipment, uh, the athletic stadiums, uh, the television cameras, the television sets that enable people to watch these events, uh, human relationships. Uh, just think how uh, wealth in such forms as telephones, uh, pens, paper, post offices, uh, automobiles, airplanes, trains, uh, make it possible to maintain human relationships over time and distance. If we didn't have these things, uh, when a child moved any considerable distance from his parents uh, and his uh, childhood friends, uh, that would be uh, the end uh, of those relationships. They would then exist just as memories. I wonder uh, if any of you can think of an example of a human activity that is not improved in some way uh, by the employment of wealth. Can you think of anything where that is just not true, that uh, wealth makes no difference to the activity? What would be an example of such a thing? Philosophy class. Philosophy class. Well, what about the classroom? What about the books? How much uh, philosophy could we have if we did not have uh, the various philosophy books. Uh, uh, take away uh, Aristotle, uh, that's a big diminution in philosophy. Take away Plato, you have a further diminution. Uh, take away the books of all of the uh, significant philosophers, and uh, how much is left of philosophy? Not much, yes, uh, Mr. Meditation. Meditation. Okay, well maybe that would be a candidate. Uh, if your goal is simply uh, to make your mind a, a blank, but I imagine you could do that in more comfortable or less comfortable surroundings, but uh, that is probably the closest uh, that I've ever uh, heard anyone come uh, to an example of something that uh, is, is not facilitated in any significant way by wealth. Any other uh, contenders? Sometimes people say sex. I don't think that would be a good example. Uh, think of such things as inner spring mattresses. Uh, ru <laughs> uh, 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 running, running water, uh, perfume, lingerie. Uh, so there's a lot of things. Now, uh, I refer to the psychological aesthetic aspects of the satisfaction of physical needs. We have certain uh, needs that can be described as physical, our need for nutrition, our need for elimination, but uh, our uh, nature as uh, rational beings and the psychology that that entails uh, introduces additional aspects uh, uh, in, in the satisfaction of our needs. Uh, when we eat, the uh, food is not the sole consideration. Uh, there are uh, related issues, uh, such as the ambience, uh, the, the atmosphere. We're, we're interested in things like uh, the china on which the food is served, the table setting. Uh, is there music in the background? Uh, are you seated in a plush, comfortable chair? Uh, what, uh, uh, and, and other things of this kind. When we uh, eliminate uh, we gain something important, I think, from things like indoor plumbing and uh, proper ventilation. Uh, these are necessary uh, for what you can call psychological aesthetic reasons. Uh, as rational beings, I think we also uh, have a need for variety and novelty. Uh, a cow is content to eat the same kind of grass day in and day out. Uh, but uh, human beings uh, have a need 
for changes in their routine, uh, breaks in the same pattern, uh, which uh, they find intellectually refreshing. And uh, I think uh, uh, most of us uh, find the appearance of new gadgets uh, something very interesting and enjoyable. And when we buy uh, major goods, uh, newer models as, as replacements, uh, that's something that's uh, typically an enjoyable experience, buying a new car, uh, something of this kind. And uh, the fact that uh, we uh, derive uh, intellectual refreshment from novelty and variety and are willing to do things uh, for the sake of their novelty, uh, this has uh, important ultimate practical benefits. See, uh, would we even have something like the automobile if uh, the first adopters uh, had not been uh, free to adopt it uh, just because of the sheer uh, joy of, of that novelty? Uh, here we are back 110 years ago, let's say, uh, the very first automobiles appear, and they're astonishing uh, 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 machines. The, the horseless carriage. For all of history up to that point, uh, the, the best form of locomotion that we could have of a personal nature was a horse, or a horse-drawn carriage. And now here's this machine that doesn't need a horse. Well, was the automobile a practical means of transportation right away? No, it took a while. But the fact that there were people uh, willing to buy them uh, just for the sheer joy of the new and novel, uh, that gave the automobile industry a start. And then they, uh, from there, they improved the, the quality of the product, cut the cost, and the basis was laid uh, for a major industry. Uh, more recently, uh, perhaps in the experience, uh, the personal experience of uh, some of you, if you're uh, in your 40s or 50s, uh, the personal computer industry. Uh, when that started in the very late 70s, uh, that was uh, pretty much a kind of to intellectual toy. Uh, and because uh, it got a toehold on that basis, uh, it, it became possible later on uh, to extend the, the product and develop uh, really practical applications. Uh, the point here is uh, the fact that we desire wealth in novel forms leads us to experiment uh, in ways we otherwise wouldn't and to find practical applications uh, that otherwise would not have any chance uh, of coming up. Uh, we can't always insist that we know the practical applications from the very beginning. It's important uh, to be able to experiment <coughs> with new forms of wealth just for their sheer uh, novelty and, and intellectual challenge. Now, uh, I make a further point related, uh, point two, the perfectibility of human need satisfactions and the use of human faculties. Now, uh, there are, uh, we, we've had, we pretty much have the same basic needs uh, throughout man's entire presence on Earth. People have always had a need for nutrition and they've had a need for health. Uh, they've had a need uh, to be able to move. Uh, we have uh, the faculties of seeing, hearing, uh, tasting, uh, touching, and the ability to think. And uh, the use of wealth uh, improves uh, our ability to exercise all of our faculties and capacities. Uh, let's take, uh, start off with the wealth applicable uh, to the needs for nutrition and health. Now, our caveman ancestors uh, produced food, and uh, it kept enough of them alive uh, to feed offspring, uh, to at least maintain their population, and then uh, slowly and gradually to increase it. So they were satisfying their need for nutrition and health to some extent. But what was the extent of the wealth they used to do so? Well, their labor, that isn't the wealth, but that's uh, the means of producing it. What wealth did they produce to satisfy their need uh, for nutrition? Arrowheads, flint objects. Right, flint objects, arrowheads, spears, uh, maybe slingshots, uh, some primitive traps, uh, nets perhaps uh, to catch some fish. Uh, so this is some wealth employed in uh, satisfying the need for nutrition. 
what's the extent of the wealth we employ today, directly or indirectly, in satisfying our need for nutrition? <coughs> Uh, slaughterhouses, uh, the distribution channels, what do you mean, the trucks and so on, and what else? Fishing boats, canneries. Uh, canneries, uh, fishing boats, uh, canneries farming. not just for fish, what? Farming. Farming, okay, uh, and, uh, chemical fertilizer, what stands behind the farming? The chemical fertilizer is one, what else? Well, genetic engineering is only now beginning uh, to come. The, the packaging and what what enables the farmers uh, to farm uh, with the success they do. Monet, what would be some examples uh, of things that uh, radically improve agricultural productivity? Combines. What? Combines. Combines. Uh, tractors, harvesters, and what do these things depend on? Steel. What's the uh, steel, uh, the iron to produce the steel, uh, the, pardon me? Petroleum. The petroleum uh, the, to make the fuel, the factories to construct these things, uh, electric power to enable the equipment in the factories to work, uh, ships and trains and cargo planes to move these things around, uh, the mines uh, where the ores come from. Uh, if you think about it, uh, a huge chunk of the economic system is directly or indirectly uh, connected with uh, our satisfaction of our need for nutrition. Now, why uh, do it in such a, uh, an elaborate, uh, wealth-using way? What, why not uh, be content uh, uh, to have a simple wooden plow, uh, some hunting implements? Pardon me? <coughs> well, what do we accomplish uh, with the means that we use. More you know, a vastly greater production requiring uh, much less overall labor, sparing labor uh, for the production of many, many other things, and giving us uh, a much wider range of food uh, and a much better uh, diet, uh, which has a major contribution to our health and life expectancy. And uh, the wealth that's applicable uh, uh, to our need for, he for health well, uh, that certainly includes uh, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the chemical industry that supplies it, uh, the hospital uh, buildings, the construction industry that builds them, uh, all of the uh, diagnostic equipment, uh, the prosthetic devices, uh, and uh, indirectly, our food supply. That's uh, a major uh, preventive of uh, very many illnesses we might otherwise uh, contract. Now, going even further, uh, I want to indicate uh, how uh, different forms of wealth that we have uh, facilitate uh, what we're able to accomplish with our senses, our eyes, our ears, and our brains, and also our limbs. Uh, what would be forms of wealth that enable us uh, to take in uh, more uh, information and experience uh, through our eyes? What would be some illustrations? Pardon me? Eyeglasses. Eyeglasses. Television. Television. Contacts. Uh, contacts. Uh, pardon me? Computers. Well, the computer monitor, uh, you could say. Uh, now, more recently, uh, lasers uh, to correct various uh, eye problems, like cataracts, uh, glaucoma uh, lasers are being used, uh, and I guess in other applications. Uh, motion pictures, uh, someone said television sets. DVDs, uh, VCRs, uh, these are things that are enabling us to uh, uh, take in uh, more information and experience uh, through our eyes, motion pictures, I think I said that. Uh, what about our ears? Hearing aids. Our hearing aids. Stereos. Stereos, hi-fis, uh, phonographs, CDs, uh, iPods now. Uh, I forgot to mention uh, microscopes and telescopes in connection uh, with our eyes. Uh, what about uh, uh, our uh, ability uh, to, to move about? What would be various forms of wealth that contribute to our capacity for locomotion? Segways? Well, segways, uh, that's one little device. That's that uh, 
what is that sort of gyroscopic bicycle or something? Okay, what, what would be more significant? Uh, although that's legitimate. Pardon me? Yeah, automobiles. Starting, I'm going way back, uh, starting with shoes, rafts, canoes, sailing vessels, uh, pardon me? Horses, uh, any other domesticated animal, camels, elephants, uh, wagons uh, and the wheel, uh, uh, oxen, uh, then railroad trains, uh, then uh, uh, automobiles, uh, airplanes, rocket ships. Uh, they're all uh, in the category of things that uh, contribute to our ability to move about. Now, their connection uh, seems to be primarily through uh, to magnifying the power of our legs. But uh, think about the fact that any machine or tool, any machine or tool, is enabling us to accomplish more with one or other of our limbs. Uh, think of a tool like a hammer or a screwdriver. Uh, we're uh, using them with our hands. Uh, could we accomplish with our bare hands uh, what we typically need a hammer for? I don't think so. Uh, could we shape uh, an automobile fender uh, without uh, fairly complicated uh, equipment? I don't think we could do that. Uh, all tools and implements enable us to accomplish more with the same four limbs. And these other things enable us to accomplish more uh, with the same eyes, ears. And then there are things that enable us to accomplish more uh, with our same brains, uh, such as books, uh, calculators, and now, more recently, uh, computers. So uh, I, we need wealth, uh, really, uh, if, we want, if we value such things as seeing, hearing, moving, and doing, wealth contributes to all of this. It's in the name of all of these things and uh, the various other activities, art, science, music, uh, personal relationships, athletics. Uh, in the name of all of these things, uh, we implicitly must value wealth. If we value uh, being able to do these things, we need to value wealth. And we need to value what wealth itself depends on, a division of labor, society, and capitalism. Now I have uh, a brief uh, discussion here in point three, it's considerably longer in the text, uh, of the fundamental bases of our limitless need and desire for wealth. Uh, I say the capacity of our imaginations exceeds the power of our arms. Uh, our desire for wealth uh, surpasses uh, our ability to produce it, because what do you need to form a desire for wealth? Knowledge of it. Knowledge of it. Imagine it. Uh, what do you need to desire a mansion? Maybe. Think of it. Visualize the mansion. What would you need uh, to either uh, build the mansion or produce goods uh, sufficient to be able to earn the money to buy the mansion? Which do you think is more difficult? To get the goods to buy Obviously, to produce the goods. Because when we produce, uh, what does our ability to produce always reduce to, ultimately? Well, e even if you're a top executive, uh, what limits uh, what you're able to accomplish, even as a president of General Motors? But you 